Okay, so as we continue on this week's uh, sabbatical uh, portion reading and feeding, which is Mikhet, and it's a tenth in the uh, cycle and series of Sabbath house readings and feedings, you can go to our website and download the most recent copy. It's very important for the disciples to have the the latest and updated um, copy of this as well as um, another document called the Rastafari or the Hebraic Judaic Year which actually gives the times for this for this um, 2011 going into 2012 actually from 9 12 2011 to 9 11 2012 to 9 11 2012 and that can help to at least more properly orientate um, ones and ones with the um, Hebraic, Judaic, yeah, really with the heavens, the, the calendar um, of the heavens and the time calculation of the Most High according to the context of the scriptures. Now, we're in the 10th uh, weekly reading and seating and the ninth um, portion Hopefully you study the ninth portion, which was called um, Tekemet, or in the Hebrew, Vayeshev or Vayeshev. And I think it's probably important for us to, to review that and just to make a continual transit from, from the old to the new so to get the consistency of the story. Now this tune right here, uh, this is that. Some of the Aswad, the Aswad when some say before Aswad sold out, but whether they did or not, it's just interesting how um, the effect of Babylon or the Gentile world system, and what we're seeking to do here is to is to have a common unity and 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 the knowledge of the Son of God, the Bain Ha Elohim, the teaching of His Majesty, it provides us that core and that foundation that we need to build upon. And the Torah, the Orit, we call it the Orit, Ethiopically. In the West they call it Torah, is very important. And we've also um, recorded some portions on um, Sabbath and, the, and additional meanings of the Sabbath or the context of the Sabbath. I don't think we've posted it just as of yet, but hopefully over this particular um, strong that they call weekend that is leads into the whole Christ mass from the Western perspective. Now if you're not into that and do not have certain forces of men and people around you pulling you into that then this can be a very crucial time to kind of turn off to that and to focus on the true word of Jah Rastafari and the true scriptures if you're able to. Some people, people are in different sort of um, situation. So each one's situation is a little bit different. Now we're going to continue with Mikhet, but also before we take this down, Hala Selassie and the Tower of Babel teaching, we wanted to introduce the next part. There's another part that we had run out of uh, time in that particular recording up to part three. So at the end of part three, we had introduce this particular book and what we want to do with this book is to first of all once again introduce this book this is the the Ibogaine story the Ibogaine story I think it's the it's called the Staten Island Project and in the 60s there was a cure that was found in Africa for addiction for addiction to such as um, drug addiction um, heroin and cocaine and those kind of, um, I guess they call it opiates, um, even to cigarettes. It, it cuts off that and alcohol as well, beers, and, and, and it cuts off the desires, these desires. And it's something from, it's a, it's a plant, a herb, a, a wood, a bark from Africa known as um, Ibogaine. And this particular book here, and we had actually met the compiler, the author of this particular book, the Ibogaine story. 
we wanted to connect this with that teaching on Hala Selassie and the Tower of Babel on Ethiopia, Imperial Ethiopia. We have Ethiopian Hebrews at home and abroad comprising the new Israel vis-a-vis the New World Order, the Novos Ordo Seclorum, the Gentile World System, or white supremacy, the world domination of the Anglo-European. And we understand that that system is in crisis right now because they don't know who Christ is. The system is in crisis. However, we also must come out of Babylon. And the first level of coming out of Babylon is coming out of the spirit. First of all, recognizing the mystery of Babylon. This is why we did this particular teaching. And there's a connection with the, 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 the Torah portion, readings and feedings. Because the Torah portion, readings and feedings, they establish now the true alternative to the Babylonian isms and schisms for our diasporic people, no matter where they are, whether they're Ethiopians at home or Africans at home, African diaspora, whether they're African Americans or, or, or West Indians or, or Hispanic blacks or our, our people from that part of the world, it still brings us, it brings a core of unity when all of us, wherever we are, are in the same meditation, the same meditation, the same meditation of of, of heart and mind, of spirit, of soul, and this also now helps us in the physical or the body or the world situation, you know what I'm saying, because this helps us to come to the level of community, because the particular brother or sister, I think it was a brother who said, I think it's the Heights, was talking about, um, made a, a reminder of coming out of Babylon, because ones are going through much tribulation in this particular time and the tribulation is bound to increase because what is unlike the other we are not like them in other words in spirit and and they can perceive this in spirit as well so we have to maximize the time we have to study and show ourselves approved so that we will be able to go to that next deraja or that next level when time and opportunity arise that's why the teaching discipleship is so important. And brothers and sisters, on the discipleship issue, it, your applications and, and other requests and, and communication has not been lost. If you have not received the contact or responses because the harvest is great and the laborers are few. However, these means right here still provide an opportunity to teach and to reach those no matter where they are and others who might not have internet online try to download these programs and share those with, with those who are willing to learn. But what we want to show here was from this particular book, this particular book about the Ibogaine story, the report on the Staten Island Project by Paul De Renzo. Dana Beal, I think that's the person we have met, Dana Beal, and members of the project. It asks the question here, it says, has the cure for addiction been suppressed since the 60s? And now this also connects with the whole Twilight Zone time manipulation teaching that we had presented before, because um, it's the addictions, you know, which are systemic Babylonian addictions that actually um, keep us distracted or off track from the root and the ground of truth. So consciousness, when we talk about consciousness, there's a lot that's involved in the whole entirety, the totality of consciousness. But the, the most direct way is the teaching of His Majesty. It's the teaching of His Majesty and the discipline, the discipline of mind. And, and making that time, remember the Sabbath time is that one-seventh of our time that is Yahweh's time, but he actually gives it to us. It's really time for ourselves. That's why the Messiah, the Moshiach said that um, the Sabbath was made, the Shabbat was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So on this point about Hada Selassie and the Tower of Babel, from this book right here, let's see if we can give you a, a, a clip right here. You can see this is Mussolini right here. Right, this is this is pictures of Mussolini. Look at his ugly mug. Right? Mussolini. Now he's a type. This is like saying Esau. He's almost a type of Esau, in a sense. He's a type of Esau. And um he shall challenge even the prince of princes. 
And here they say on the, in the Ibogaine story, Ten Pot Caesar heaps scorn on a fallen Ethiopia. This is 19, this is 1936, right? And then now at the bottom, right here, you can see a picture of His Majesty surrounded by the retainers and the faithful, the faithful ones, the faithful martyrs in the white robes, the robes of righteousness. And it says here, Hala Selassie, the true Negus, the true Negus, and king of kings at the head of the imperial guard. This is from the same period of time. So the contrast between Christ and his kingly character right here, Christ and his kingly character, and between Antichrist or between Jacob, Yaakov, true Israel right here, and between Anti-Israel or Rome, Ethiopia here, original biblical Israel in prophecy, and between Rome, neo-fascism, all right? Now, Look at this picture carefully right here. If you notice, these are umbrellas, processional umbrellas. Now, whatever this is behind here is not really clear. And these may be certain type of sticks or like makomias or other type of long sticks right here. But if you look at it, it's as though His Majesty, even right behind him is, is a stick right here or some kind of vertical image. But it's like His Majesty riding on that horse is between two crosses, is between two crosses. We can say Christ, even Christ in his kingly character, has, has, has overcome the crucifixion of war. So many different sort of crucifixions that his majesty has overcome. For our sake, verifying and justifying the true way or the template of the true Moshiach, of the true Moshiach. Now, this book is very interesting, and there's um, more in this book, actually. It talks about the Ark of the Covenant. In fact, um, there's, a, there's a little link right down here about the Ark of the Covenant. So we might just wrap this particular part of the message up on this particular subject, and then we'll get more exclusively in our Torah portion, reading, reading, and feeding. Um, here on this page, and he connects... There's a connection of, what's so interesting about this book is this, that these are ones who are saying that, this, are pointing out the, the, the evils of the system of Babylon, the New World Order, New World Order Seclorum. In other words, concerning medicine and medical and, 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 and um, the issues of Christianity, of false Christianity, and then using Ethiopia, presenting Ethiopia and Africa and the black, in other words, as an alternative. And these are not so-called black peoples, but these are so-called Gentiles or white folks who are testifying and bearing witness to the truth. Now, as, as a diametrical opposite to, we can say, to Antichrist and white supremacy and counterfeit Christianity is place Ethiopia in this particular document here about Ibogaine, the Ibogaine story, asking has the cure for addiction been suppressed since the 60s, since the 60s. And so on this particular page, it, it touches on a couple of different issues. Where should we start out? Where should we start out from? And then it shows as a counter, just to sort of a counter opposite right here, it shows you as a counter opposite, you see Hitler there. You see this about the persecution of the European Jews. These are some of the kind of um, uh, German Nazi mysticism there, as well as these pictures here, you understand, of these other mystic traditions. And this is one of the few works that I've seen recently by um, European authors or Anglo-American, European, and probably Jewish, uh, white Jewish authors that actually presents our case and the true case for his majesty, for Christ and his kingly character in its proper context. In fact, in this particular document, they also have that page of, of um, the COINTELPRO about stopping the rise of the black messiah is also presented here. So it's a very balanced view of the 20th century leading into this 21st century, but the issue still remains 
the same. So they say right here that Je Jesus or Jesus was a radical, a Jewish radical, exclaimed Cisco, the original Abby Hoffman. You've got to read uh, Schoenfeld's other book, Those Incredible Christians, said Dana. And here's a quote from it. He believes the book of Revelations is actually the earlier document. Like the book of John, it is associated with the beloved disciple who is reputed to have lived more than a century. Revelation seems to have been written by someone whose first language was Hebrew. Unlike John, which was written in the Platonic manner in Greek with dialogue, that could make parts of Revelation the equivalent to the visions uh, Wirat dictated to the scribe when he arose from the starred state. The production of excursions forward of Jesus, of Yeshua, and others to next decision point. Another quote, the interest of the beloved disciple was to debrief Jesus after his trip to the end of the epic. In other words, interesting, we have to get this into context that, that according to these, these investigators into the book of Revelation and other related documents, they're saying that the interest of the beloved disciple, speaking of Johannes, speaking of um, of John David or Johannes the Beloved, distinct from John the Baptist, that the interest of, of John the Beloved, the Beloved Disciple, was to debrief Yeshua, that Yeshua already had, had journeyed forward in time. And now we're learning actually that time travel and a lot of things we're, we're, we're learning that was already known or speculated or reported on, and people made it seem like that was fantasy. You know, like we look at the phones today and we look at Star Trek. People will say, oh, that's just fantasy, and now look, everybody's using it, and people not taking it a second thought. Like, well, how many of us was around then and didn't accept that as true, but now we're using the cell phone? How was that done? How were we not able to see that was coming down the line while there were others who were putting forward those ideas who were saying, those things are coming down the line, look for them, and people laugh them off, but now look at the reality of it. So the, the interest of the beloved disciple was to debrief uh, Jesus after his trip to the end of the epic, the end of the age. In other words, Jehoshua journeyed to the end of the age, and now Johannes was briefing Jesus after his trip to the end of the epic, initiated, this was initiated, key word Hanukkah, at the Hebrew root word of Hanukkah, or Hanukkah is initiation, initiated by his crucifixion and resurrection. For instance, Revelation chapter 22 and 1, and he showed me a pure river of water of life, pure as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and the Lamb. Out of the throne of God and the Lamb. Do we have two gods? No, the throne of God and the Lamb. The Father and Son is one. Revelation 22 and 2, in the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river, on either side of the river, if you look at Africa and look at the river of Egypt, the river of Ethiopia, for example, we have east side, which is Arabia, you understand, pale red Arab Arabia. Then we go to the west side and we have Negro land or black Africa. On, but, but now it says in this, looking forward, on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bear twelve manna of fruits. That's interesting. On either side of the river was the tree of life. And they were trees of life, but on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bear twelve manna of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Also, 22 and 13. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. 22 and 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments. This is interesting. Notice that. Notice how much you hear counterfeit Christians talking about we're not under the law and, and dismissing any Old Testament foundation of Torah or law, teaching, reading, or feeding. But here in Revelation says, blessed. 
are they that do his commandments, that they may have right, that they may have a right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city, that they may enter through the stargate. Yeah, um, real talk now. Through the stargate into the city. But, but, but over now, what is the qualification? You understand? What is the, qual the qualification? It tells us once again here, as in other places, is blessed are they that what do his commandments. That, that, that not even know about the commandment. I mean, you can know about it, that's good for you, but do you do it? So knowledge of it is important in order to do it. But more than just knowing about it or even teaching about it, the key is blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have right. So they have a met. They have a right, you understand, to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. So there are these gates of, of, of the Adesiti to Jerusalem or the New Jerusalem. Now, the author here goes on and says, what this implies is that only those who keep kosher, only those who keep the kashrut, the kashrut or the kosher. You know, Christian now, they said, you know, we're, we're, I eat pork and whatever kind of swine and unclean stuff. As long as I just pray to Jesus. You know what Jesus is going to say? Jesus is going to say, when we say, Lord, Lord, he said, I, I didn't know you. Get away from me, you lawless one. You Torah-less ones. You were Torah-less. But I believe in you, Jesus, but you didn't do what I said. You, you, you know, maybe for some, would, you know, some are told these by their pastors and preachers who know better. So perhaps they might get, you know, some mercy because of that if they truly were misled and misfed. But it says what this implies is that only those who keep kosher, only those who keep kosher by regarding the host not as the literal blood of Jesus. See, the host in the church, in the Beta Christian, which is our coming together, you understand? It says when two or three come together, I am in the midst. So when we come together and recognize what we are coming together, that means First, we must be informed, and then we must get involved. So this process right here, even of discipleship, is giving one the information. And then those now who do become informed and do, hear and do, then that, bring, that brings a common, that, 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 that establishes a, 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 a common unity. That establishes us on the foundation. And no other foundation can be laid, so we have to find the foundation. You know what I'm saying? And learn of the foundation. And then we can build on that foundation. So first is information, being properly informed, and then is us getting involved. This is why the harvest is ready, but we as the laborers, the opportunities are right here for us to even come out of Babylon. In fact, the time is very good now and in the present time that we are in considering the present circumstances and situations that are going on. It's actually the excellent time. But there's a lot of distraction, confusion, and, 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 and mixed-up moods, attitudes, and misorientation that many, that many believe as true sincerely. It's not that they believe that they believe a lie, but they believe what they believe is true as sincerely, but they never have really checked it out for themselves. You understand? They're, they're trusting someone else but not going to source, not studying and showing themselves approved. But it says that we have to regard the host not as the literal blood of Jesus. You know, like in the church, said, this is the blood, this is my blood. And some people actually think of it literally as blood. Go ask around and you'll find that what we're saying is true. But as the plant, they say, soma of the tree of life, that is, as the living blood of the Spirit, which indwelt in Yeshua, in Jesus, when he was baptized by John the Baptist, get to enter the village of the dead. In other words, get to enter into the village of the dead, or really the resurrected from the dead, more correctly. It says, I told Charlie Kaplan that the effect of millions of addicts taking ibogaine might well be like the, quote, scatter from city lights messed up interstellar 
intercellular observatories, a sudden zone of translucence, which would be perceived from a distance as the event limit, as like an event horizon. I don't know if you what I'm talking about as the horizon. And dig this. According to flatter, flattery in uh, Zoroastrian eschatology, at the time, at the end of time, a final yasna, that means sacrifice, a final communion will be performed in which the bull called Hadayas and its fat are mixed with white haoma. This differs from ordinary haoma just as Hadayas bull differs from ordinary cattle. Then he break down something here where it says Hadane Pata being the ancient priestly usage of haoma that actually contain harmel. But to the resurrected dead, the mixture is the drought or the drought of immortality. Now, we just want to just include that there, and perhaps we'll go over that. But here's the real part that we wanted you to, or another part we wanted you to pay some attention. The ancestors, so the response to that was the ancestors. I also read a book called The Sign and the Seal that claims the Ark of the Covenant still exists. This guy, Graham Hancock, uses textual analysis his own archaeology, plus the well-known fact that the Falashas of Ethiopia practice old temple rites not used in mainstream Judaism. Pay careful attention to that. That the Falashas, the Beta Isra, the Exilists, they practice old temple, the old Solomonic temple, not Herodian temple, but the old or the Ezrian temple, but the old Solomonic temple practice rites not used in mainstream Judaism, the Eurocentric white European Judaism, since the Babylonian exile, all to bolster the claim that the Kahanese actually spirited the Ark of the Covenant off to Egypt to keep it from being defiled when Manasseh tried to introduce idols into the temple. Now, this is interesting now we're on the Ark of the Covenant issue because we, we know what the recent news coming out of um, um, modern Ethiopia is, is that the Ark of the Covenant might be sold by ones and ones. And we, like we said before, let not your heart be troubled about these things because we may well receive authorization and, and the wherewithal in the community to build our own Ark of the Covenant. You know, then how do we know that that is not a fulfillment of this time? Since what he did, in other words, who, what empowers the ark is the will of God, the will of the true God. That's what empowers the ark. So those who do what the true God, Ha Elohim, the God and Father of our Black Lord and Savior, Hoshua HaMoshiach, who does what pleases him, he gives his favor, he gives his Shekinah, shock and awe to. So the first thing we need to do is to study and show ourselves approved. That's why that verse is there. That's why that verse has so much application and resonance. Key word, resonance for us. If you don't know what resonance is, look up what resonance is. Because sometimes people might hear us use these words, and we're, we're very specific on certain usage of words. And it's for the true disciple. You see, the student disciple is different. The student waits for the teacher to say, okay, class, open up the book. The disciple is already there studying it. And the disciples are already, already seeking it and, and staying in the discipline of what is taught, you understand, and what is learned. And that's what, why it says disciple and discipline. But Hancock, back to Hancock, he even found ruins of a replica of the first temple on the Egyptian island of Elephantine near Aswan. Now, Aswan is more in the south. And you will find traditionally that the, that, that, that the Egyptians and Aswan tend to be more of the original ancient, ancient Egyptian descendants, and those black ethnic Egyptians as you go further south, you understand, like in places like Aswan. From the end of the Persian Empire, when he believes the Ark was removed to an island on Lake, um, they have Tanith in the Abyssinian highlands, which should be Ethiopian highlands, on the island, 
he found intact the stone altar for animal sacrifice. On the spot where the ark was kept in a tent for 814 years. So the ark, according to Ethiopian sources, was kept in a tent for 814 years. After that, it was taken to a church in the town of Aksum during the mass conversion of Ethiopian Jews, of Ethiopian Judahites to Christina. In other words, there was a particular time when the message of Christos, the message of Jesus Christos, was properly, was properly communicated. And the Ethiopian Jews, the black Jews of Ethiopia, finally were able to recognize that Jesus Christos, the true Jesus Christ, the real Christ, not the European counterfeit or not these other versions, you understand, but the real Christ, as Ethiopian eunuch also recognized from, from his time, Acts the Apostle chapter 8, was Christ. So here's where we get the Falasha Mora. Some call this the Falasha Mora, the Falasha Amhara, that, that connection right there. But this now explains the inner workings of that whole story so we can put it into proper context. And this was around the time of Constantine the Great in Europe. So the one in Europe was named Constantine the Great. The one in Ethiopia was known as Izana. Izana. Ethiopia was the only place where most Jews accepted Jesus, Yehoshua, as it says right here, Moshiach. Isn't that interesting that Ethiopia was the only place, the only place where most Jews, most of the Hebrews accepted Jesus Christ as Messiah. Now, as we go on, Dana Muse, one of the authors of this book right here, Muse, by that time half the population were Jews. And let's put it into context. Half of the population were what we would call today black Jews. This is before we, we look at Ethiopia today, we say Ethiopia is a Christian nation, but before that it was a Jewish nation or a black Jewish nation, a Hebraic nation. That's the root and that's the truth. They were there for a long time, maybe before Solomon and Sheba. And so these people here, they have it right concerning that. There was one set, there were, there were different, there were different populations, there were different groups that came to Ethiopia and at different periods of time. Some remain apart from others, found isolated places where they can set up their community. Others join with other communities, just like people do and just like we also will do. Some will go to Ethiopia coming out of Babylon. Some will go to Ghana, Nigeria, South Africa, other places, maybe even the Middle East, Yovazan, or Israel, the state of Israel. Yovaz, that is, but this does not change who we be, period. So let us understand that. Now, here's the quote. The Ethiopians actually brought the ark out in front of their army for the last time in 1898. This is the key. Ethiopia, for the last time, they brought out the ark of the covenant in front of their army in 1898 when they met the Italians at Adowa. When they met the Italians at Adowa. They say St. George, Caduce Georgis, came riding down on his, they have on his dragon here, with a heavenly host, and the Italians were slaughtered. The largest European army ever to invade Africa until that time. Emperor Minulik reproached his, his, his couriers, saying that it was not right that they rejoice at the death of so many Christians. Interesting. Interesting, but Minulik took the proper response. It's not for, you know, it's for Minulik to defend the country and to kill the enemy. It's, it's not, you know, they were Christians and they claimed to be Christians, but you have to remember that a lot of, a lot of the soul, like a lot of the men, the people on the ground, there's other people that are actually behind the scenes, and they send a lot of the youths and the young people and others out there, uh, for, you know, all hyped up and stuff like that. So Minulik had the proper response saying that it was not right that they rejoice at the death of so many Christians. Even though their Christianity might be what it is, Roman Catholicism, still it was not 
correct. So he took the high Christ moral ground. The next time, in 1935, the Italian Jews poisoned poison gas. And in 36, fascist black shirts massacred the monks at Oxum. They massacred monks at Oxum. But Mussolini, who thought he was Caesar, Mussolini thought he was Kaiser or Caesar, didn't know or care about the Ark. At that time, some of us say that they came for the Ark. You understand? But either he didn't care about it or they could not find it. He lost his armies in 1941. First, a quarter of a million men before the British in Libya, the Libya connection, in February. Then the British brought Haile Selassie back from exile to Khartoum. And as he ascended into Ethiopia, it says tens of thousands of Rastafarians came down from the hills. And the house of David re-entered Addis Ababa at the head of a mighty host. In all of East Africa, a, quarter, a second quarter million Italian troops were captured, almost without a shot being fired. After that, Italy was out of war. Those who want to understand what comes next with Ibogaine or to study the story of abject collapse. Study its strange attractor. The rematch, this is the strange attractor. Now notice what they're putting here. The rematch between Caesar and Christ. Or we could say Haile Selassie versus the Tower of Babel. Or versus Babylon. Like Caesar or Christ versus Caesar in that sense. The return of the Negus. Christ, the return of the Negus. Remember, he was Jesus' distant great-grand-nephew. The Ark is still at Oxum, or as is, you know, Oxum is a, is a city, it's a big city. So who knows, we're at Oxum, and we know that there are copies of it as well. Um, the Ark is still at Oxum. No one gets to see it but a single custodian who always goes blind with cataracts after a couple years. It goes with the job. Once a year, a uh, kinneret, or at what they have kinnerets right here, they bring out a replica covered with a blue robe emblazoned with the dove of the Holy Spirit, of the Holy Spirit. Now this is very, very interesting right here because if you go to scriptures, and, and you look in Torah, you will find that the ark never, like you see these pictures that, that, that even we use some of these pictures where they show um, the priests, the Levites carrying the ark of the covenant, and you always see the ark exposed, and you see the gold and everything. That's not how the ark goes about. It's very clear. In fact, we have a, um, we have a, a, a particular picture that we might show you in the next part of this, or might show you right now, when the Ark of the Covenant was, um, this is from an old Rasta Vibration, an old Rasta Vibration um, magazine right here. And this is a copy that we have. But let us show you one of the times when the Ark of the Covenant was uh, seen. A couple of times. There's a couple of places when the Ark of the Covenant was in public during the time of His Imperial Majesty. Although we can't see a clear shot of it, you can look at this particular picture right here. I don't know if you've seen, this is His Majesty right here. All right, this is His Imperial Majesty. Now, right over here, this is the Ark of the Covenant under this blue velvet type of a blue cloth right here. Now, if you go to Torah, whenever the Ark of the Covenant is in procession or is in public, it is supposed to be covered or is in transport it's supposed to be covered by such a blue, purple type of cloth. So as you can see here, you see His Imperial Majesty. You see the Ark of the Covenant. You understand the Ark of the Covenant covered up right there. And this particular article, you understand, is about the Ark of the Covenant in Ethiopia. And here we see the Ark of the Covenant. We can even see the dimensions of it right there next to His Imperial Majesty and also the priests, you understand, the priests and the Ethiopian people, you understand, 
around. I think there's a priest presiding right there. Now it says down here, Hila Selassie at a religious ceremony outside the church, outside the church at Aksum. Even on the coronation and some of the coronation photos, if you pay attention to this sort of shape, even behind his and her majesty, the Ark of the Covenant is there as well. But the Ark of the Covenant does not go out in procession the way you see it in these kind of pictures or in some of these TV shows or, or so-called bad or unscriptural movies, rather. You don't see it going out in public just showing off like that or like an Indiana Jones movie or so forth and so on. It's not done like that. But Dana here is going to con con conclude, and we're going to conclude with this particular portion right here where Dana, Dana Beale says that, that seems to be the story, Ark of the Covenant into Africa. I will gain out. Because now out of Africa comes a new sacrament. It restores the cultural importance of dream time. It ob 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 obviates the need for mortification of flesh from the sun dance to acupuncture. The improvement over harmaline is sufficiently dramatic to rehabilitate a lost branch of medicine. Ibogaine heals wounds that will not heal. For addiction medicine, it's like the, hey, that opens every door. What dope, uh, dopaminergic uh, visualization can do, ibogaine visualization can undo by going back in virtual time to undo it. And it is appropriate that emancipation from pathologic reflex is located in the dream time. All our concepts of spiritual realm, a platonic realm of ideal analogs, which generate everything in the real world, are cultural relics. You get this? Are what kind of relics? Are cultural relics of a harmaline induced state. As Dick poetically put it about the previous possibilities of harmala alkaloids, quote, Saint Sophia is going to be born again. She was not acceptable before. And a few pages earlier, he also wrote, quote, the Godhead is impaired. Some primordial crisis occurred in it, which we do not understand. Ibogaine clears, clears up the problems with primordial crisis, at least. It wasn't the Godhead, but the previous sacrament. It wasn't the Godhead that was impaired, but it was the previous sacrament that they used. And in this case, it's speaking about harmaline that was impaired. A perfect sacrament wouldn't require additives. A perfect sacrament would not require additives. And like we said, that's from the book, um, the book, uh, the Ibogaine story. And we thought that connection with the Ark of the Covenant was particularly interesting. And that's what we were going to actually deal with at the end of uh, part three of Hyla Philosophy versus the Tower of Babel, as it also addresses uh, more of our Ethiopian Hebrew black Jewish story and gives us some additional um, um, details and facts to investigate and to study. So uh, stay tuned, brothers and sisters. Y'all willing, more is to come. Shalom, Ras Teferi Ine, Ras Yadinos Teferi Ine, Wendem Yadim.